Hello and welcome. I'm Patrick Curtis, your host and chief monkey, and this is the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Join me as I talk to some of the community's most successful and inspirational members to gain valuable insight into different career paths and life in general. Let's get to it. In this episode, Pat takes us through his long and winding career as a quant and systems architect. From almost 20 years at the Livermore Research Lab to reinventing himself and joining D.E. Shaw in 2006, we learn about how being curious and having a unique skill set can earn you outsized pay packages. Find out why he was heavily recruited to jump trading and why his jump to Citadel was a mistake and how everything panned out now that he is retired. Hey, Pat, welcome to the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Happy to be here. Uh, this will be fun. I've been, you know, on the site for a long time, was uh, active for a while and sort of in the background, but uh, decided to come back in with my screw it, I'm retiring note, and here we are. It, has it been over a decade since you've been on? Do you think, I think so, yeah. yeah. That, that was way back. That was like seven jobs ago, so it must yeah. be a while. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Pat's been a longtime member of the community. Um, if you're on video, you'd be able to see we have matching t-shirts to prove it. We have the OG WSO shirts, so um, really old school. I actually think there might even be an older version of than this, but um, this is a pretty old version. So um, Pat, thank you for joining again. And so Pat has a long and winding road, but I'm going to let him kind of give you the short summary bio of his, his background, which kind of slants a little more engineering, but I think it's pretty interesting. So go ahead. Yeah, it's engineering, but you know, lots of, of, of swings through sort of the quant space in, in, in finance. Um, started out, got out of high school, top student, went to an engineering college, blew up, dropped out, um, you know, complete meltdown, um, which is interest, interesting in the long run. Now I have students that are doing the same thing because I'm teaching, but um, joined the Air Force because I wanted structure and discipline in my life. After four years, that was too much structure and too much discipline. Um, so uh, while I was in, I finished up undergrad in Nebraska, Omaha. I was, I was stationed out in, uh, in Nebraska mm -hmm. and decided to go to grad school because I was used to being broke and didn't have anything better to do and didn't know, still didn't quite know what to do with my life. Um, did a double time master's at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, this is in the back. 80s. This is in the 80s for people wondering. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this goes back. We're talking old school stuff here. Um, yeah. So I, I applied to a lot of PhD programs. I wanted a PhD. I figured, more, well, you know, go to school. Why not? Mm -hmm. uh, it's more fun when they pay you. I, I got to say that part. Yeah. Um, ended up doing my PhD work at uh, UC Davis, which has a, a satellite campus at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which is a nuclear weapons design lab. Mm -hmm. And so they did high energy physics and computing. So I did a PhD there. Uh, I was going to teach, uh, but the economy was in the toilet. So I decided to stay and work there 20 years included about seven years of nuclear weapon design, thought I was never going to leave and just retire right out of there. But I got a call one day to recruit me out to New York City to work for D. Shaw, but not the finance side. He had sort of like a hobby project to build a supercomputer uh, in the top of a skyscraper in Times Square. So I had a corner office overlooking the ball in Times Square, which was really kind of surreal. Uh, my interview with him was, was beyond surreal. It's just, you know, being like friendly with billionaires is just weird. Um, <laughs> sure. But I, was, I had an <laughs> offer. So it, it, it's only a little weird. Um, I had an offer to teach at Columbia part time because I've been teaching a lot. I, 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 since I didn't teach full time, I ended up at like teaching at Davis and uh, uh, some other Bay Area colleges and Stanford for about four years uh, as a consulting professor there. Mm -hmm. So I was going to do the same thing at Columbia. They told me no, that made me mad. I happen to have a um conversation going with jp morgan so i said screw it and uh to to tech and things i said let's try finance world people thought i was in finance because i was at de shaw so i got all finance offers all the time but it's like no no i'm not a, i don't do finance i, I do I, I do tech and development and so i ended up jp morgan uh, the hiring process there ended up being really funny uh, lots of fun things about that then left a friend who was a friend who uh, was at uh, jump trading so high frequency trading. Uh, then after about a little over a year, Citadel, who's an arch rival of theirs, tempted me away with increasingly large piles of money. Um, so I said yes eventually. 
that crashed and burned. Uh, I was not a good fit for Citadel. We, we both found that out. Yeah. And uh, ended up at a, another finance trading in Houston because I wanted to stay in the space. I was there for almost three years. That crashed and burned. The company was just having problems and I just needed to get out. Yeah. And they had a long and long peak. So I went back to tech and did self driving cars. And then I did Instagram, working on the Instagram back end. Mm -hmm. And then I did a year at a crypto analytics startup. Yeah, cool. And then I said, it's time to retire. And so I wrote the article, in, <laughs> which is how we got here. So very, it's almost like you reinvented yourself. It's like, you were like, ah, okay, let me go into this quant finance career after 20 years. How hard can it be anyway, right? How hard can it be? But I mean, it looks like you had a, a lot of great success. It wasn't like these were like two months stints. You, you're a couple of years at Jump. You were a couple of years at almost four years with D.E. Shaw and the research. Uh, yeah. Research. You know, it's sort of, you know, you know, when it's, you, you sort of learned everything you're going to learn at that place. And yeah. then, try, then let, let's you try something else. I do a lot of mentoring work. And so it's funny, I tell people, if you don't walk in day one with a plan of what you're going to leave with, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, talk about your, before we get into like the whole yeah. finance realm, I want to, you spent so long, um, it's Livermore, right? It's so Livermore Labs, right? yeah. yeah. Yeah, so not too far from here. Um, so you were there for almost 20 years. What was it? I mean, obviously it was almost a computer science research, some of the, some of the stuff, but like you said, you're some of the nuclear Weapons yes. stuff, like obviously very like sciencey high level stuff where it, you, it was high performance computing. Yeah. And it turns out that, you know, lots of people want high performance computing, which is why it's, you know, I've been able to sort of work places. And one of the things I say, I used to, I was a co-lead on, on a, on a physics project. Actually, it was uh, the project that just did uh, the, the, uh, the fusion that got more energy out from the national Ignition facility that was running codes. I worked on 20 years ago with this guy. Wow. Wow. And I used to joke with him that, you know, there were, I could work anywhere I wanted on the planet, but he was sort of like a nuclear physicist. And I said, well, there's only like five places in the world that you can work. And yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's it. And so, yeah, I learned a lot about physics there. I, people used to think I was a physicist. I learned so much physics. Yeah, 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 for sure. And so you were basically there and I guess, what was the career like there? I mean, obviously there's not a lot of research scientists listening, um, but I think just it helps kind of maybe open their eyes in terms of like, what's a career look like? You're just in the lab, you're, you're playing, is it hard? When you say computer science, high, you know, high performance, are you working, are you playing with hardware or software at the nano? The, mostly the mostly, mostly software. I mean, software. There, there's some hardware research there too. Yep. Um, part of it, you work directly with manufacturers of new computers, which is really fun. Cool. That I, I have a collection of like, Interesting computer T-shirts from manufacturers like Thinking Machines, uh, which was a big, big manufacturer in the or a big computer manufacturer in the eighties. Uh, we're just trying anything to make things happen faster. Yeah, but it, it's interesting in science and finance both um, that you have this desire to do, to do something at a slightly higher resolution than somebody else, so you can get an answer faster than somebody else. In science, you're trying to get a, a scientific breakthrough. You're trying to get a paper ahead of other people. Yeah. In trading, you're trying to, you know, get an answer on what the market's going to look like in a in a few microseconds. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you feel like? I mean, it's very strange nowadays to see someone right out of school. I mean, you went, you were an academic, you came out of your PhD, and then you went and worked at this lab. Yeah, I still think it's probably pretty rare to stay somewhere 19 years right out of right out of school. It really is. It's funny because my mom told me because I said I'm going to stay here forever. She said, "Don't ever believe that." Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how good it is. Uh, you'll change, they'll change. You'll want something new. And, and, you know, the move to New York was, I was after something new and that I didn't even know it until I interviewed. Cause I, 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 I why, years, why I interview. you never interviewed anywhere else. You just said, this I, is great. were they paying you really in crazy well, or what was going on? They paid me pretty well. I mean, it was good. Um, yeah. it, was, it was solid. And, you know, it's like when we went through the, the you know, boom and bust, the government's still there paying you, which is good. Yeah. So um, but low, uh, low variance, but you know, high six, you know, mid six figure, like hundreds, hundreds. It, it was, it was like in the, in the low to mid hundreds at the end, uh, yeah. which was okay. I mean, yeah. it was. There were times when you could have jumped out. There was a time when I, I was very tempted to uh, to go interview at Google when Google had like 300, 400 employees at it, right? Because uh, they were looking for people that did C plus plus and Python, which is my, which was like my sweet spot. Yeah. And um, I decided, because I didn't live in the Bay Area, Bay Area, I lived in the East Bay. Right. At the east edge of the East Bay. Because um, you talked about interviewing, I had 
the last place I'd interviewed was when I finished up my PhD, which had been maybe 15 years prior to me leaving. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed on Labor Day weekend Friday, and I got caught in Labor Day weekend traffic, and it took me two and a half hours to get home. You're like, I'm never commuting there? And I said, I will never, ever do this, ever. I will never yeah. be in the Bay Area, which turns out to be wrong. Yeah. Um, so I just I just said no to lots of things. But I got, I got a call one day, and I just said, oh, this sounds cool. It was a, it was a blind, cold call from a headhunter. Yeah. They're looking for interesting and unusual people. And then I realized I'm an interesting, unusual person. And I also realized I hadn't interviewed. I didn't know if I could. What do you mean? You, you were, I, had no, I had no practice. Oh, if you were like, if you were rusty or like you just, if you could even survive. Or yeah, could, could I get a job outside? Yeah. Uh, because the national labs are sort of like banks, which are super incestuous. Yeah. That if you go, if you go to JP, everyone's coming from Goldman or Bank of America or, or, or you know, they just make the, they make the circuit, right? Yeah. And it's like every interview is, oh, I haven't seen you since we worked together at. Yeah. And, uh, and so breaking into finance, which led to a very interesting story with one of the MDs. So let's talk a little bit of that. So, you know, it's 2006, everything's booming. Yeah. And maybe some cracks initially in 06, but so you're, you're at the labs and then what, you know, how do you get in touch with DE Shaw or how does DE Shaw get in touch with you? It, it was, uh, they had they'd hired a specialty recruiter to find people that were um, quote unquote interesting. Um, <laughs> and so that was you know, people that, so their, their philosophy is you hire somebody who excels at anything and they'll probably excel at the thing that you want them to do. So, um, you know, I worked there with this guy who was one of like the top 10 uh, one day winners on Jeopardy. There was a, a concert uh, a trumpet player. Yeah. Um, the, uh, let's see. Let's see. Somebody else had 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 uh, his administrative secretary had graduated cum laude with physics from Princeton, but was trying to break into a music career, so uh, was not pursuing uh, you know, a graduate school in physics. It was a weird collection of people. So this guy was out going finding weird people, and he called me. Mm -hmm. um, I had some of a footprint because when I was at University of uh, San Francisco, I built the world's largest one day supercomputer. In, in the college gym, uh, which put me on the front page of the New York Times, which was weird. Um, <laughs> it's also on the front page of, of Time Magazine. Because because you because you built the largest computer in a day, or what, what do you mean? Yeah, it was a day. We took, we took laptops, we built a ginormous network. We're trying to see if we could build something that was fast enough to be in the top 100, 500 uh, fastest computers, because there's a list every year. Got it. The top 500. And it was sort of like the last year where it might possibly be possible. Yeah, uh, be, because you know, it, it sort of moves at a pretty consistent rate. And I knew uh, six months when they, they do it every six months that six, even six months later would be too late. Yeah. And so uh, somebody told the New York Times. So I got a, a call from their uh, tech editor and he interviewed me over an hour or so. And then it went out and no one at the lab knew until like they saw it because they have new scrape ser scraper service. So I got a call like eight o'clock in the morning and people said, what the hell is this? <laughs> and what year? What year is this? this is it 04 or it's like 04 or something like yeah. that? Yeah. It was right before, right before I moved to Stanford. Um, yeah. But you know, he was scraping through National Labs because it, it, it was a good profile fit. We we're building a supercomputing, uh, a supercomputer for protein folding, and, and so, so yeah, doing okay. the stuff. You need um, so and I was big in the Python there? community very early, so that was another piece of it. Yeah, and so D. Shaw had a recruiter. They, the, what was the interview like? Tell me about that, because you mentioned that, right? You said it okay. Was, well, the interview was, was 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 they fly you out to New York. They fly out to New York. I get there. I call my wife. I say it was like January second, mm -hmm. which is a very sad time to be in New York because, well, uh, I, I just remember you know driving through. It was gray and horrible, and you know gray slush everywhere. I said, yeah. no way, I'm taking this job. Period. Yeah. Um, though my mom was from New York, so I saw, thought I'd do it. Thought, thought I'd go back to see what happened. Then I went to the interview and talked with people. It was puzzle problems. Um, one guy asked me, you know, what's the square root of 1.2? And that turned into like a 30-minute discussion about analog computing and Newton's method and numerical stability. It just was this crazy, deep, amazing dive from a very simple question. Um, and went on and on. And at the end of the day, I called my wife and said, I totally want this job. Yeah. And uh, then you know, even, though, even though I walked back to the hotel and um, – the gutters were filled with dead confetti and the smell of vomit from New Year's Eve oh, in Times Square. But <laughs> I didn't care because uh, it just seemed like 
a chance to work with amazing, smart people all around me. Because everyone was like top of field. And it was like, I want to work here. Yeah. Uh, it was a no ego kind of place, which was great. Because everyone was so good, you didn't need to prove yourself. Yeah. So there was not any you know, political drama and scrambling. It's really nice for a long time until I sort of you know, got, got finished on. But the, the funny part was, so at, at that time, David was personally approving every hire. So I got called back a few weeks later after having gallbladder surgery. Oh, no. And so uh, they, they tried to schedule it the same day I was having the surgery. I said, well, uh, I, I'm busy that day. We'll have to do something else. So they called me back for a second round of interviews. I'm wearing a white shirt and a tie because I, I felt it was actually more formal. I have a bandage underneath and I'm afraid it's going to burst and I'll just blood, yeah. blood would come out of the shirt. <laughs> and at the end of the day, at like four o'clock, so they were just stringing me along because David wanted to talk with me. When you, you say know, David, you're talking David, about David Shaw, the founder, the founder. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, Dr. Shaw. Yes. Um, and so I go up and I interview him in his office, which is on the top floor penthouse office. Uh, the sun is setting over Times Square in the background. It's blinding me. I can barely see. <laughs> we talk about sort of stuff, just generally. You know, he was interested because, you know, I had that career bump, shall we say, or academic bump when I was a dropout. We talked about that and sort of, you know, what philosophy was on things. And it was really funny because some great advice actually came out of that. Because uh, he was talking about you can't solve every problem with money. But there are problems that you can if you're willing to pay the price to do it. And I said, yeah, you know, and being able to understand the distinction between problems you can solve with money and problems you can't solve has been a really good sort of philosophical tidbit to take away from that. But here it is, you know, the sun's going down behind his head. You get this glow around his head. like, a <laughs> And you can see the lights coming on in Times Square. It was just one of the most surreal days of my entire existence on this planet. You'll never forget that day for sure. And uh, yeah, so... Then, then I got an offer, and uh, it was actually less money than I was making at the lab when you factor in housing and everything else. Yeah. Um, but Quite it was a double pay, but still less money. Uh, yeah, yeah it, was, it was more cash in, but much more cash out. Yeah. But I felt like I wasn't going to go anywhere and do anything new at the lab. Yeah. And so it, was, it felt tapped out, and so, which is a sure sign to move on. And so I did, and it was great for four and a half years. Yeah, so but I sort of um actually the first day you walk in or what that's like or did it, you know what type well of it was super weird because they sent out because everyone came in together from the finance side and this weird research hobby it was essentially David's hobby business which he spends you know, you know more money than I'll see in a lifetime on, on a hobby business yeah. but um everyone was coming in from Princeton and Yale and Stanford and Harvard and I had I had a, a a Google ad address, a Gmail address. And it was like, okay, I just, I'm just glad it wasn't like AOL or Hotmail. Cause that would have been close. <laughs> um, but everybody was coming from the, all these really prestigious backgrounds. And you know, mine is Nebraska, Omaha. I didn't even have a major. It was general studies. I have a bachelor of yeah. general studies. Yeah. Um, well, you but, should feel honored to be in that group, right? Well, damn straight, I worked for it, but um, yeah, which, which is the thing. And it's funny because I, when I look through people at the site, a lot of people are looking for like, you know, tell me the target school to go to, the classes to take, the clubs to join, and then I'll get this job, and then I'll make this much money. At you know, there's no formula. You have to do what you're get good at and what makes you happy, yeah. and it's all the things that you want to learn. So I did that. Um, but you know, it, it led me to the finance thing. As I said, yeah, you know, part of it was. Um, I had just been told I couldn't take the Columbia job. It was a part-time night teaching job. It wasn't going to be distracting, but they felt that uh, the last person who had taken a job from the, the from the shop at Columbia had left to go to Georgia Tech. So ah. they were afraid, I guess, that if people you know taught too much, they'd like it too much and leave. Uh, so they told me no, and I was mad. And I was just going on a two-week vacation, so I was mad for two weeks to yeah. stew on it. And that's why I told J.P. Morgan, I said, uh, oh, look. And had J.P. Morgan and Gold uh, and, and Goldman Sachs both bidding against me, and ended up at J.P. Morgan. This was a better fit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this was this was. Uh, are you talking about the D. Shaw was saying you couldn't do Columbia? Could, couldn't couldn't take the Columbia job. Yeah, yeah because they're afraid you would love to be faculty too much or some. Right. Like, yeah. Well, and the fact that now I'm back to being faculty, I can totally understand it because you know what, I really like it a lot. Um, because because teaching is fun. But uh, so I went to J.P. Morgan, which was weird uh because i didn't have any suits to go because this was still like a suit and tie kind of thing yeah i went to uh brooks brothers 
and told them that I was interviewing at Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. And I was wearing sort of my tech, you know, jean shorts and, 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 and like a short sleeve button up shirt, something like that. And the salesperson said, that will never do. <laughs> and got me a nice suit so I could did, have, had a bit nice interview suit. Uh, did, did the interviews. I kind of, it kind of dragged on for a while. So, sort of my first case of playing hardball because uh, JP didn't want to uh, Goldman to get me. So they gave me a uh, uh, exploding offer for mm -hmm. like a day and a half at, at, at you know, four o'clock. Yeah. So like two hours prior, I just mailed them and said, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep pursuing this. I understand the offers off the table. And they just like, like instantly backtracked. So I understood, you know, you know leverage and they said, well, yeah, they, they, they were super interested, um, ended up there. Uh, the, the most, the coolest interview part though, was I went into this managing director's office. Mm -hmm. And as I said, tech or finance is super incestuous, banks go to bank, go to banks or from target schools and all these other things. Mm -hmm. And so he said, well, you've been doing math and science. What makes you think you can do finance? And so I was a little salted by that. And I said, you know, I, I do math, scientific programming. We've got differential equations. You've got differential equations. We use Monte Carlo, use, you use Monte Carlo, solve problems. And I said, there's just one difference. And I kind of leaned in over the desk, kind of looked like, and said it again, there's just one difference. And he leaned in and he said, what is it? And I pointed at him and said, you keep score with money. And he stood up and he slammed his fist on the table and said, damn right, we keep score with money. So I stood up and I slammed my fist on the thing. Yeah, you keep score with money. And he thought that was just the funniest thing. Um, and so I got an offer. It was a good offer. And I took it. <laughs> Um, so wait, pay raise, pay raise coming out of D shop. Oh, this, this is big. Yeah, coming coming out of D shop, right? pay pretty well. Okay, um, it's funny because uh, I've had. Are like, you talking two hundred at this point? Two fifty at this point? Um, Three hundred? Because like you're, you're, you're all, all all in. It was a lot actually. Um, yeah, was is like four four hundred something, which is which is really good for the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, uh, oh six to oh ten to ten. And, yeah. Um, executive so, director title, which I didn't realize at the time was really useful because that's that's a hard jump to make. Oh, so that, that was, that's what you're getting paid at JP, you're saying, when you jumped. Was, yeah, with the jump. Director. Yeah, so yeah. so I was in the mid threes or something at D-Shaw, which paid pretty well. Yeah. Uh, which was interesting because I had an offer from Google uh, coming in, and I just talked with them, and they put an offer on the table. And that afternoon, D-Shaw just jumped everyone's pay like 30%. And it's like, well, you know, I'm going to make more doing the thing I really like here. I'm going to stay. So I didn't take the Google job. So the Google job would have worked out great in the long run, but you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, I think I think I made the right choice at the time. You still got me. there. Right? You still did, did it well. For I, I, I did just fine, which is and had fun. That's, that's got to be the the end of the story. Yeah. But you know, but the big bank was interesting. I was used to bureaucracies. I did the. So did this was this was 2010 when you jumped, right? 2010. Yeah. 2010. After about four and a half years at D Shaw. Yeah. It's, it's funny because I had sort of. They were working on this new computer, and the first computer was done. And the chemists were really happy because they had a computer to play with. And I built out tooling that was good enough for this machine and one that was 10 times faster that was in development. So the ar architecture guys were building something. They were having fun. The chemists were having fun. And I said, I'm going to be bored for the next few years because I've sort of done everything that needs to be done for now. Yeah, so It's one of the things that made it easier to say it was time to go do something else and learn a different discipline. Yeah. So you know, I learned about big ass banks and how they work and how their bureaucracies are really horrible and stiltifying. It's hard to get things done. And sort of all the drama that makes things go at the banks and how it's about headcount and projects and, and, you know, political, you know, subterfuge. Angling and, and weird stuff going on. And, and weird stuff, but yeah, but it was a good time. I learned a lot there. I mean, that's sort of the point is now I, I, I sort of moved did out. Did you have from, a team of developers under you or how was it like you were small, executive small. director, but like how did it work? Were you managing or were you more like on the front lines actually? As more front lines. The, JP was a big mix. Um, you even had managing directors who were still slinging code. Um, the first day uh, I, I, I met one of the managing directors, another one, not, not, not the slam his fist guy, but yeah. uh, another, another one. And all he said was, I heard you're the guy who makes code go fast. And I said, okay, I've been, I did JP Morgan for 30 minutes. Yeah. I'm walking, walking around the floor and they said, I hear you're the guy that makes code go fast. I said, yeah. So he pointed a code on the screen and says, make this go fast. And I said, change two lines, it'll go 15% faster because you've got to be a baller, right? You can't just go, oh, well, yeah. No, just point at the screen, two changes, 15%. I didn't know he'd been working on it for like three days. So it was in some pretty good shape, but it wasn't there. 
And then he, he ran it. He already had all the timing framework around it, and it ran 14.7% faster. I said, sorry, I was off a bit. Yeah, yeah. and he's like, and he's just he just says, fuck, this is just. <laughs> and he typed in a message that was broadcast to the entire team. When this guy talks, listen to him. Yeah. Uh, so it's a baller move. Uh, I, <laughs> It's it was an awesome first impression, right? Yeah, it was based. It was based on something. It wasn't complete wild ass guess. I mean, you, yeah, yeah. I I knew it'd be pretty close. Um, it committed a a minor but very unprofitable error in terms of coding. So that helped. And I had a team. And I worked a lot on things like code quality and teaching quants how to actually program because uh, they're smart. But sometimes they just do stupid things because they just don't know because they haven't spent the same focus time, time doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, you're your whole thing was really about fine tuning the code to be absolutely streamlined. So like, instead of the spaghetti code of like 400 lines, you'd be like, no, do it in this one line. It's like, do it this way. I mean, I used to, there's one guy I used to fix his code by shouting over my shoulder. He said, this is broken. I said, you did that. He said, no, I didn't. I said, yes, you did. And he did. He says, oh yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, it's making people be more efficient. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's people need to be efficient. The code needs to be efficient. You're trying to solve a problem. It's helping you solve a problem. So what was your code being applied to do trade uh high frequency trading what was so this was this was risk management for the investment bank risk management. So, so lots of you know lots of modeling lots of monte carlo lots of what if scenarios yeah. um so it was so this is this is sort of like the code that kind we, of interesting we were, time to be there 2010 they're very still investing heavily oh well, i was in the bear stearns <laughs> building they had just bought it and uh and moved a lot of the team there um i think they bought bear for the building yeah i don't think they bought it for any of the people or any of the assets other than the building, they wanted the building, uh, which was really cool to go up to the big, you know, fancy boardroom on top of the old Baird Stern's boardroom. We had meetings up there sometimes. Uh, it was really cool. But again, I learned a lot and, um, you know, I was, and I was doing well, got, you know, got big bonuses and even sort of above, uh, you know, promised bonuses. And, and that was going well. Could have had a great career there, but, uh, you know, it was a, a buddy just said, come move over to the buy side and do high frequency trading. Uh, it was a buddy that I had given a, uh, hint to about how to do some file transfer stuff faster in the past. He says, oh, I used that. I made the firm like 10 or $15 million when I switched to using it. I said, <laughs> well, I, I hope you got part of it. Yeah. <laughs> and he did. Uh, so he said, come work for it and you can get part of it too. I said, oh, okay. So that's how I ended up at Jump Trading. Yeah, uh, yeah. Part of it was um, I wanted to stay in New York City because we were living north of the city in Westchester. Yep. And didn't want to move the kids in high school because that's the kids were in high school. It's just a bad time to move teenagers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're already so dealing with enough crap. Yeah, well, the, 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 when they talk to you, they're not generally very happy with you. You have girl, boy, boy one, right? of each. one of each. Um, one of each. Which one's older? Older boy. Older boy. Okay, yeah. I have so he was, he's going through that. Ugh, don't want to talk to my parents. Yeah, phase. yeah, I get it. I get it. But uh, you know, I don't get. I don't really get it yet. My my oldest is seven right now, so I've. Seven uh, you'll get there. You'll know. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's also when I learned how to fly when my kids weren't talking to me because I figured they wouldn't miss me too much. <laughs> but uh, but so anyway, they, the jump had open was opening a, an office in, in New York City. Yep. So I ended up. It, it, Is it that got still open, by the way. I know they were Chicago initially, right? Jump trade. Yeah, they're, they're, they're primarily Chicago. It's actually a pretty good New York office. Okay. Cool. So um, yeah. so I worked in New York, uh, but started six months in Chicago. So I lived in Chicago for six months. Family stayed behind because uh, it was temporary while they got the New York office running. Which of course, New York City things just take longer than you expect to build. Mm -hmm. uh, did that and um you know th then you know citadel just piled money because they wanted to, to build the same sort of uh, engineering quant development group so i've done mostly how did how did jump get, how, what does it even look like like how does jump so i realized recruiters they realize oh hey this is the guy he's really amazing at python efficiency setting up systems whatever so they find you yeah but then is it just like um is the, the conversations go like hey we want you to chat there's an interesting uh you know well, I had a sort of architect type role where we think you'd be great. And by the way, we'll, you know, double your pay. Like what's the, what was it? Like, it, is, it actually was sort of like that. Um, yeah. uh, my first contact was one of the two owner principals of Jump. Yeah. So uh, it's like, oh, would you like to have a chat? Just chat about stuff. So we chatted about stuff. I said, oh, what did, yeah, wouldn't you love to like come out to Chicago? What does that even look like? But what does it even look like? Like, hey, let's go for lunch. I'm flying in. Like, what is it? No, it started as a phone conversation. It says, yeah. why don't you come out to the city and catch a Cubs game? Because I'm from Chicago. Yeah, yeah. And said, why don't you and the wife come to the city and catch a Cubs game? Right. And I said, well, that sounds casual. I, said, I know it's an interview, right? It's, a, it's like not, not an interview. And, and you can meet some people and see if it, see if it kind of gels. Yeah. And this is the point of the career 
that people are making jobs for me and say, you're interesting and yeah. you enhance people around you, which is essentially been my core function has been like code guru for a long time. Yeah. That, and I sat down with clients, particularly a place like Jump, which is more of a bucket shop where uh, groups trade their own portfolios and they, you know, using the firm's money and they take a share of profits and, and return to the firm. So the firm wants everyone to make more and faster and use less of resources because it enhances profits. And so I would sit with teams. I was a wandering gypsy and I would just sit with the team, see what they're doing and say, well, if you do this or this or this, it'll be better. So um, while building new infrastructure for like the next round of trading to make things better, mm -hmm. um, mostly on the modeling side, because that's where most of my uh, experience is. And this is kind of when you started writing for us a little bit here and there as well. Yeah, I, I think I think I said JP when I first, I don't even remember who approached me or something. Uh, and I, don't, I don't remember either. <laughs> it, it's been a while. Almost a decade um, ago. But yeah, so it's, it, originally I was trying to write a, like an article every two weeks and I just, I was, I was running a little dry on interesting topics. And so I just said, oh, I got to stop for a yeah, while. So and then you were teaching, you, know, you were teaching at Jump as well. Like you were doing in-house, like Python. Did, did a lot of in-house teaching. I, I like to teach. I mean, it, it, it was originally the plan with the PhD was to teach. Yeah. Go to a research institute, but with a big teaching component. I like working with people. I like them. I like knowledge sharing. There's a lot of people in finance where secretive, you know, being secretive is important to them, right? I know something you don't. So that means I can get a lock on my job because nobody else can know this. Yeah. And I think that's terrible. It's bad. It's bad for the business. It's, and it's bad for you and everyone around you. It's better to share it. Everybody better to know. You can still be better than everybody else. Yeah. Uh, and when you teach things, you get better than everybody else. And everyone looks to you for answers. So you, you enhance your position by teaching. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, I ran lots of in-house shops in London, New York City for JP, uh, ran, ran lots and lots of shops at, uh, uh, you know, in, in shop training for uh, like how to wrest the most out of what you've got. Mm -hmm. That, you know, just even some small things of how to do this and, and, and do modeling because people just don't understand where all the sort of all the performance goes. And performance really, particularly HFT is king across the whole spectrum from modeling side to uh, to execution side, HFT and, uh, so, so you know, speed and optimization is the utmost. It's basically the difference between second place and losing millions upon millions of dollars. Your first loser uh, kind of thing, and, yeah. and it really is. It's a, yeah. there's so many winner take most trades that you, that you just want to be there. Yeah. And modeling's hard, and you start with something. I remember I was, when I was in the Air Force. Even I, I did weather satellites when I was a programmer in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the U, uh, U.S. Weather uh, Central had just bought the, their first Cray computer and it took them only a week to predict tomorrow's weather, which was, <laughs> which was an amazing thing. Said, yeah. But the codes will get better and the computers will get better and soon enough we'll be able to do tomorrow's weather today. And yeah. may, may, you know, maybe it'll only take us 12 hours. And that, now of course we have like continuous, you know, uh, you know predictions <laughs> for what the weather's gonna be like that updated every 10 minutes because it computes there. Mm -hmm. uh, but finance is like that too. Uh, I remember seeing so many places where we need this every, you know, it's for tomorrow's trading and it takes us 36 hours to compute it. Right. It's like, we know how to do it. We just don't know how to do it well. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, of, so much of quant finance is just that. It's bigging, di, di, you know, building tools to dig in the dirt, to get a signal and turn that signal into money. Yeah. Throw um, away everything else is knowing what to throw away, right? It's knowing what to throw away, knowing how to deal with the large data, how to just do smart stuff. Yeah. And um, it gets built up sort of over time. Uh, one of the places, the original trading code was built on an IBM PC AT that would put print instructions on trading instructions on the screen for them to call their broker. It's awesome. <laughs> and that code kind of persisted and got bigger and bigger and faster and faster. Um, but it was still, you know, larded down with mis sort of mistakes for if you were doing it now. But yeah. that carried forward and it worked and people trusted it. So it wasn't like you could throw it away and start from scratch easily. Yeah. But so making making it work for what it needed to do was a large part of what I did. The technical debt was real. You had to like almost build it from scratch, build up from scratch. And it, it felt that way. And yeah, but you couldn't just like deliver it. You had to build that trust along with the code. Yes. And and you couldn't outsource it. It was all really tightly, either tightly held stuff. I remember getting papers that were uh, you know, sometimes people would write it out as if, if it were an academic paper and then put it in a vault somewhere in the company and they crack it out to show you so you could understand the mathematical underpinnings of it. 
because I've always been good at math and I've liked math. I might've been a mathematician if there weren't computers around. Yeah. Um, but that's helped me deal with physicists and quants who are mostly physicists and signal processing guys anyway. Um, and so it, it's, it just keeps coming up. Uh, you know, understanding math is good. Yes. Uh, you know, math may be hard sometimes, but understanding it is good. Uh, so that, that worked out. So you're at Jump. Um, but you're not at jump for too long. No, that was really short. That, that really was Citadel piling money on the table. I told them no a lot. Yes. And every time I told them no, they would just pile more money until I said, okay. And so Citadel eventually was just like throwing, what, a million dollars at you to come? Close. Come close. close to a million. And that was just a base or what, how, how was no, it? No, it was, all, all these places are pre pretty solid base plus a, a pretty good bonus. Bonus depending on like what you're contributing on your level or how the firm does that overall? It's typically a mix of the firm and sort of individual contribution, which is always hard for people like me because I'm not yeah, trading directly. Like, yeah, exactly. Like that's what I was, that's why I'm asking them. Like, how do they actually know? They guess, they ask people, are they happy? Yeah. Uh, you know, did, did you make more money? Sometimes it's very clear and direct. Yeah. I can point it, I make this change uh, and this got better. Yeah. And, um, or, you know, so, so my pitch is always, before you were doing this many simulations per year, and now you're doing this many simulations. Um, mm -hmm. At JP, I made a change with how some processes were launched, and I did a back of the envelope that said it saved the company probably three million dollars a year. Yeah, and then you show that to your director and say, "Here, what do you think about this?" <laughs> and and then they say, "Huh, maybe we should give you a bonus so you can keep doing let, this." Let me, let, yeah, talk to me about that process because i think it's not natural for maybe people who are more academically oriented or like or quants maybe yeah. are as like as in at least from what i've seen some of my friends mit phds are mm -hmm. they're not they call me when they were like i have this job offer what should i do or like because <laughs> they, don't have, they don't have that kind of uh mentality of like they just love doing work that they love and it's less about the money or eking out every last profit where sometimes the front office banking guys are a little more like sharks going after it. It's um, like, yeah, how can we do more of this? Um, yeah. So how, how did you, is that, is that what you would do? You would just kind of prepare a packet and just say, you know, I did this, this, and this and, and go get a meeting around bonus time or what would you do? To so normally it could, so it was a long process. It was one of those things at the, at JP in particular, magic things always happened in October because that was right in front of bonus time. So people would like stash away really good stuff and try and make it all hit in October, which I thought was terrible, right? Yeah. Um, so in, in one of my articles, I actually wrote about how I would enlist people that I helped do, particularly because I was doing so much working with others yeah. that I would get them to write my MD and their MD and say, this really helped. And then, you know, I, I wanted that constant barrage coming in that, oh, he helped Around October. <laughs> That you know, and not all in October, especially, but but even in January, even even as bonuses have already been written. Yeah, you, know, you want to keep that that constant beat of I'm providing because I'm service oriented, right? Right. Or cost center in sort of the less polite way to talk about it. Right. But I'm a cost center, and I know that I don't make money directly. I make others make money. Yeah. And in finance, you want to be as close to that river of money flowing by so you can get your bucket in and pull it out. Right. Um, and so I wanted to stay close to that. But remind everybody sort of continuously that their buckets of money are bigger and more full because I'm helping. Like, hey, I Everybody just need you an extra 10 million a year. Can you tell them that? <laughs> can you right? Can you let them know? Yeah. And you know, when people could put numbers on, I wanted numbers. Yeah. Because yeah. I wanted to be able to say to my managing director, hey, look, I saved the firm this much money. Mm -hmm. You know, the quants I helped made more money than the other quants. Give an didn't example make. of like a type of things that like you would do where you'd be able to actually quantify it. Is it like speed of this, or so? Is it like oh, you need less resources, or was it more? Like sometimes, it's, sometimes it's pretty easy. It's like it's a resource thing, right? Right. Um, so it was just funny because the same thing happened at Instagram. Um, but I, I did. I, I sped up a process that where it took a while for processes to start up because they were doing something stupid and naive. It was, it was not even stupid. It was naive, right? They just didn't know. They didn't know they were doing it. And I knew they were doing it. And I knew they could stop it. And so I did a. I sort of poked around to find out how much computing costs per year to get a sort of a per hour cost. And I said, all right, I'm saving you know, five minutes per launch because these programs were taking five minutes to launch where it was doing no real work. Yeah. And it was being launched all the time. And I added it all up and I said, divided by the per hour, it was $3 million. Yeah. And I told my MD, I just saved the company $3 million. You're yeah. welcome. And you can, and it could be just as blunt as that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, 
And same thing, funny thing was Instagram, there was this stupid little mistake deep yeah. inside of the Instagram backend. And um, yeah, it, was, it was easy enough to do. And uh, actually some other guy was poking around and noticed something that looked a little off. So he asked me about it. Then we dug in hard on it and found it. And, and removed. it was like 10% of the cost. Yeah. So it's like- It adds yeah, up at that scale, it matters. Yeah, with billions of users, it adds up fast. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and Instagram's actually really big on that. It says it doesn't matter how good your fix is, it's what does it do? That you can come up with something that was just brilliant beyond all belief that has like zero impact on the bottom line. They didn't care. Yeah. You can come up with a stupid fix. If it saves Zuckerberg a billion dollars, he cares and it will be reflected on you. Yeah. And banks are sort of the same way. It's, you know, show, show me the money. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I learned that at Jump too. And because uh, sort of the guy that, that recruited me out there was really good at that. He, he would quantify everything he did. Yeah. And he could tell you exactly how much money he made the firm every year. Yeah. And so he was kind of like, if you want this to keep happening, that's the, yeah, it's like, uh, things, like well, give me the bonus. And, and once you have enough bonuses and he doesn't have to do it anymore, it's like, yeah, and you must keep me happy and interested. Yes. Will, not, <laughs> not leave and go to arrival. It's just, I'll just leave because I don't need to work or want to work anymore. I, yeah. it, had, it had to be interesting to him too. So tell uh, me, yeah. So tell me, how did your pay scale? Because you were, you, you know, you're D Shaw, you're getting paid pretty well, 400s, you know, by the end. Then yeah. you get to JP, JP's giving you up to. It's sort of like, uh, I think at, at the end, ended up about 500 at uh, JP. JP, then jumps like, oh, we can do better. We can do better. So it was like a 25% raise there, and yeah. maybe a bit better than that. And it's, you're it's making like, like, you're making, you know, over half a million dollars at this point. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm making like 700 or so. Yeah. Like that. That's a big jump. And then. That's a big jump. And but, Citadel, you know, like, hey, we can get you even closer to <laughs> get you closer. To and you know, it's, yeah, Citadel All In was you know w w was a uh, seven figure thing, and it's like that was pretty good. Uh, there's there's bonus and, and sign on bonus and everything, but um, you know, no, but that good. that obviously didn't last very long. No, it only it only lasted a year, and I didn't actually get to see all of it. I had to give some of it back. Okay, uh, what happened? So let's talk about that because I think that's a really good learning. No. It is a learning thing, and sometimes it doesn't work out. Um, so partially, sure. I was in, it sounds like you're doing great at jump. Like you I, do, I was doing great at jump. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 sort of the only regret I have in my entire career is that I didn't stay. Didn't say jump. Yeah. Didn't say jump. Yeah. 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 That um, I was tempted by the big piles of money, but I was also tempted because the offer sort of had like three parts to it. They wanted me to work on like internal training, which I really like to do. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to stand up a development group. And which is sort of what I was in at, at, at Jump. So they want to recreate that sort of experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd have, you know, free reign to hire, hire my team. Mm. And, and it turns out that didn't happen. Sort of like none of it. None of it happened, yeah. Uh, partially because the, their CTO was in an internal political battle that he lost. Mm. And he was fired. And I was fired. I get it. So you were like, there was an internal battle. All his recruits were like, you were in that. Yeah, we we, that we were no longer... Lost. Needed, and but frankly, the fit wasn't good. I, I was already looking because I, I I felt the fit wasn't good. I produced, I produced good work. Uh, I, I ended up you know working on the research cluster, making that really great. In fact, one of my friends interviewed at Citadel afterwards. I said, "Look at this great research cluster we just built." And it's like, oh, I built it for you. You're welcome." But yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's hilarious. Uh, okay, so you're you're kind of nearing the end there. You got fired or whatever. The whole group gets whatever the CTO plus. Is kind of told, hey, you're done. PTO and his, and his project groups. Citadel also like hires people and sees what works out. They, they are kind of a spaghetti at the wall thing. And I knew that. And I knew this was a possibility. So it was not, it was not devastating. I called up my wife and said, you know, sort of like good news. Said, What's the good news? I got fired today. I'm going home. <laughs> I have some free time now. <laughs> I got, got a little time. It's like, okay. And so um, you were you were in Chicago? Did you so you went from New York? I, I was moving to Chicago. In fact, that, that we were we were literally selling the house. So one of the reasons you I called stop, you said good news, stop selling the house, don't sell the house. And basically I called her up and said, uh, yeah, take the house off the market, please, before we end up hopeless. Uh, yeah. wow. if, we, if we'd gotten an offer and accepted it, we would have, uh, you know, been without a house and still living in New York. Yeah. Um, would have been bad. But, um, you know, so, so I was in the process of moving from New York to Chicago. Yeah. And so, that, that, so that didn't happen. So then you're in New York and, you know, it looks like you didn't start anything. You ended up going to another quant. Uh -huh. A quant firm down in Texas, yeah, Quant Lab. And so, did you move to Texas, or did you? Oh, yeah, we moved to Texas. Lived there for oh, three okay. and a half years. Okay. Um, they How have, was that? They had, How was that? 
Don't you love, actually love Texas. Texas is great. Income taxes, uh, you know, no state income tax. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I have some family in Texas. Uh, it's, it's funny because uh, we, we moved on back to California, which my which was the end goal. When we left California to go to New York, my wife said, and we're going to move back to California when we're done. Right. 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 It, it took us 15 years, but we got back. Yeah. Um, but my son's living in Texas now. He loves it there. That's awesome. That's yeah, my awesome. brother's there. My sister's there. One of my sisters is there. It's just, yeah, uh, Texas is fun. So you, uh, how did you end up interviewing for this, uh, this Quant Lab? I think it was called Quant Lab Financial. Yeah, Quant Lab. Um, I have uh, almost always answered recruiters' calls mm -hmm. is part of it. Yeah. I've learned that lesson from that 15-year stint where I never interviewed anywhere. I pretty much interviewed once a year, always. Mm -hmm. It's funny now because I'm not interviewing sort of for the first time in a long time. <laughs> that it's much easier to say no. Well, I, I say that, but I'm actually sort of going to end up being uh, an advisor for a new hedge fund that's springing up in June. Um, but it's at a much reduced level and was sort of like a personal connection rather than a headhunter. But it, it's, it's sort of nice to tell headhunters, no, I'm not really interested looking at awesome jobs that I could do really well at. And there's sometimes they're sad, like, but you'd be so good at this job. And I feel, yeah, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to be good at that job. Yeah. Um, but with that, I'm sort of in a lot of people's back pocket when they say, I need somebody who can do this. I need a really high-end senior engineer who can make things happen. Uh, smaller trading firms in particular that want to be bigger, yeah. that there, there's, there's this real, energy barrier you have to push through to go from small to medium to large. Yeah, you got to get and all the systems uh, up and running, all, everything. It's systems crazy. and scale and people don't scale the way you expect. Yeah. And so you know, they want someone who's that, that senior engineer who can help move things along. I, I was working with a lot of junior engineers at Quant Lab, um, partially because several of their senior engineers all left the firm right after I started. Oh no. I mean, like within a month after I started. Why do you think so, that is? Do you think they were like intimidated or do you think it was just like, oh, we don't- No, no, no. It was, it was, some had been working on these other things for a long time. Got it. Uh, one, more, one more time with family. So he's just going to take some time off. Yeah. Uh, but it kind of threw me into this. Now I have to really run um, the modeling side of the shop mm -hmm. from, from scratch and advance the code and make it, you know, make it better you know, and, and advise on hardware. The nice part, it was a great learning experience. And that's, well, that's what's nice about smaller firms is that you can really get- through everything? <laughs> You have to do everything. You have to know everything. Yeah. Uh, and so that was good. But you know, the, the firm had some internal drama. There, there you know, lawsuits. And when there's lawyers involved, it takes a lot of the fun out. Yeah. Um, so I had a heart to heart with the CTO and said, I'm going to resign. And he said, I understand. And he really did because he, he resigned like a month later. <laughs> so, um, it, it, it was trying to find his footing. It was, it was a weird time for trading. Uh, yeah. particularly, particularly for the details of the trade they were making, it was hard for them. Um, so you were you were kind of had a nice learning experience there. It sounds like you did a lot of heavy lifting. Um, yeah, and you're kind of it's 2018 at that point, and so I decided to go to tech because it keeps me out of the non-compete land. Got it. Um, and yeah, non-compete what for like a year or something? You can do two it. years. Two years. Two years. Yeah, it was it was pretty egregiously bad. But I said yeah, I said I said it. Or me. They probably would have been, would not have enforced it, or you know, who knows? If push had come to shove, I'm sure it would. I could have dealt with it, yeah. and I and I knew that. But I was I was also sort of jaded with finance at that point, and said I need to do something different for my head. Yeah, and uh, and oh, so self driving cars, self driving cars, because what is cooler than a robot that drives itself with lasers? It's just it's pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> And I, I've written them. It, it's, it's pretty awesome. And my, my son actually drives in, the, in their trucks in Texas every day now. Uh, they're, they're on the roads. They are there. They are among us. Oh, um, talk about self-driving a little bit. Oh, this is so. Talk to me about Tesla's FSD versus. I said first off, tell me a little bit about Aurora. I've heard of them. But other people may not have heard of them. Yeah. So, so Aurora is one. It's the the big independent self-driver. Most of the other ones are associated with somebody. Uh, you know, Waymo's got Google's Deep Pockets. It started as a Waymo, uh, or it started as a Google uh, uh, moonshot project. Mm -hmm. uh, the others are associated with the big auto manufacturers like Cruise, Cruise. And GM. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Tesla obviously is Tesla. With and Tesla own. Tesla's got its own internal shop. Yeah. Um, a lot of people thought it was easy. That uh, there was literally an engineer who rushed to buy a car because he was afraid he would not be able to buy a muscle car that didn't have a steering that, that had a steering wheel. 
the, the next time he wanted a car. And he was off by mm, probably about 15 to 20 years. Yeah. That, that, which is what I think it will take to bring, you know, that you routinely buy a car without a steering wheel, that cars are just robots. That who, who wouldn't I, I want agree. to I agree fully. I mean, well, you see it, they get to the, you know, even Tesla FSD, I mean, obviously I want to hear about like what you think. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, it's camera versus LIDAR debate. And then also I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on specifically, like you look at like Tesla's FSD, you're getting about 95% of the way there in terms of like, but the last- Yeah, but 95 is not a hundred. Not exactly. The last 5% probably takes about 10 times as long as the first 95%. Yeah, yeah, 90% done, 90% to go on so many of these things. That that happened on the other side of the shop too, even with things like LiDAR. And I understand, you know, Musk's decision not to put LiDAR in, particularly at the time, was super expensive. Yeah. LiDAR has gotten really good and, and substantially cheaper yeah, uh, you know, real cutting edge lidar is still expensive. To, that does all all the cool stuff that yeah. that you probably need because it it seems simple that you should be able to drive a car. We drive with two eyes, and it tells us everything we need to know. Yeah, I have a, I've got, I have a friend who's blind in one eye. He drives just fine. <laughs> so really, you only need one camera on a swivel, and you should be fine. Yeah, but you're not. The the, the edge cases cases tend to dominate. Yeah, uh, th- yeah. things are weird. Um, AI can get fooled. I mean, there, there's like the Burger King stop sign debacle thing, you know. I've seen, I've heard of all these. Yeah, there's so many. It happens, and it's, it's, it's that weird edge that makes it hard to know that it's going to be safe enough. Well, just getting all the data labeled properly, getting it all in, like, like, like no, no it's, it's, it's on more, red, even be able to read the sign. Like, it's, it's more than that though, because we yeah. felt that, you know, it, it was like sort of the cat and dog problem with pictures. It was easy. I have lots and lots of pictures. I can figure it out. I can. I can get good bounds on my accuracy. And I know that I'm 99.5. I'm telling you this is a cat or a dog, yeah. right? And so we took that idea and said, if I just gather enough data and throw it at my AI, the AI will figure it out. So why is it, it turns out Because the edge cases are so infrequent. And so varied. Lost. And so varied. There's so many weird ways it goes wrong. I thought, remember teaching my kids how to drive yeah. and say, I can't teach you everything because I don't know what will happen. Yeah. And also things like creatively you know, violating laws. My daughter didn't want to cross the yellow line when there was a car broken down in the street in front of her. I said, well, the option is we wait here for two hours while a tow truck comes and tows it so we can go. Or we cross the line, which is against the law. It's against the law to, to cross the line, right? Yeah. yeah, the double line or whatever. It's also against the law to double and triple park in New York City. And well, that happens a lot, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, it's that creative you know, breaking the law and it, teaching cars to do that in ways that are, are yeah. sensible and def- defensible. Yeah. Right. Um, turns out to be very hard. Um, cars don't play as well with others as you might think. Uh, lots of early um, rear end crashes because mm-hmm. self-driving cars would break in ways when, when people wouldn't think they would. So they yeah. got run into the back a lot. Yeah, the shadow but breaking. It's like, see something that it, it... <laughs> and, so, and it's just like, I don't know what it is. Um, we have an early piece of video at Aurora of a squirrel running across the street and the car did an emergency stop because it couldn't identify it. Yeah. The squirrel lived. <laughs> but everyone else died behind the car. But, you know, the car did an emergency stop. It wasn't moving very fast. But, you know, it was, it was, yeah. you know, you know I'm not giving away any proprietary information there other than somewhere there probably still exists a video of this squirrel with big eyes getting about to get run over. Uh, but you know, it turns out the edge cases are really, really hard. And so um, it takes it takes more than just throwing lots of data at it. And so you, you have to be able to guess all the things that might happen because otherwise you have 99% of your, your, your footage is nothing happens. Nothing happens. It's not but you know, I would buy a Tesla if I was, bought, if I was in like rush hour traffic because the rules are pretty simple, right? Yeah. Stay between the lines, don't hit the car in front of you. I totally trust Elon to do that for me. <laughs> Traveling down I five, you know, with nothing but you know, nothing but empty between you and where you're going, stay in the lines. I'm good with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, rainy day when all the old lines reappear and your camera's going down because it's at night and you've got glare problems and res- resolution problems and oh, I'll have my hands on the steering wheel. Thank you. Yeah, it's it, it's it's just not ready uh, for that. And so you're, you're seeing things like you know driving in, in places where the weather's good, like Phoenix is big for Waymo. Yep. Weather's well, better. So it solves a lot of problems. Super interesting. Yeah, I think so. You were there for a couple of years, had some fun working on uh, overall. I'm self driving cars. 
Um, the intention was to retire. Actually, for most of these last jobs, is like all I have to do is work at this many years, and then I can retire. So um, first off, wait, do you make at Citadel? They were paying you. Sorry, sorry to keep going back to the pay. Yeah, yeah, they're paying about yeah, that. They're paying you really well. Quant Lab, not quite as well, but still really well. So it yeah. was uh, uh, especially it was, in Houston because you kept all your money. Oh, and, yeah, so, so so yeah, the real the real bottom dollar line was good there. Yeah. Um. So it was um like a, around around seven hundred something like that. Yep. Uh, going to a startup is weird because it's hard to value. Yep. Options, lots of options. So I got a lot of options and and a, and a solid base. I mean that that was okay. Yeah. Um. The options at their peak ended up being worth uh, about three million dollars a year. The stock has crashed before I could sell them at that, which is sad. <laughs> yes. Um. So I was brief. My network briefly went through the roof, which was <laughs> awesome. Which is funny because I, I got some snarky comments when I talk about retirement. People ask for my number. And I said, I don't really know what my number is. I, I don't even know how much money I have. Yeah. Uh, you know, really, because of these options and things. Um, well, because you now have probably meta options. Or, uh, 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 no, I sold all my, all, all my Facebook stock. I sold it before it crashed. So yay me. Okay. Hey, good. Good for you. Um, when it's, uh, right now, I my, my sister-in-law did the same thing because she was working there as a recruiter. And like they had almost like half their network. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, you sell all this. I'm like, what happens if it goes south six months later? She's fired. I'm yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. It could be worse. I have a friend. Um, she uh, got signed on right at the peak, oh. and uh, she can't even sell her shares for a loss because of wash trading rules. Because she, uh, they open a window up around when they do earnings announcements. Yeah. So, so that you can only you can only trade it for thirty days, but at the same time you're being given shares, which look like a, a like like a purchase. And if you purchase and sell at a loss, it's a wash trade. So you can't even take it. Oh, that's so they're really screwed. I'm glad I'm out of the of the of that part of it. Yeah. Uh, but right now, I, I went to a pure startup, pure bike, uh, uh, basically a, a crypto startup. So I'm holding some shares that are worth somewhere between zero and some small number of millions of dollars, and I don't know. Yeah. So if it, if it comes in, it will be my best year ever. <laughs> if they don't come in, it'll be yeah, still not a bad year. Yeah. Um, and, and learned a lot, which is also good, which but was the whole point. At but, this point, uh, you've been outside of research and, you know. For a long time? For it's a just, decent, decent run, right? Like, what is that, 15? About 15 years, yeah. Uh, but now I'm back in academia, which is fun. Um, so, uh, which also tells you about the, sort of the value of networking. Uh, turns out the chair of the department of the university that is 15 minutes from my house, UC Riverside, mm -hmm. uh, was a buddy from grad school. So I just called him up and uh, just dropped an email line and said, haven't talked with you in 35 years, but yeah. you wouldn't have to have some teaching jobs. He said, I have like 27 slots I can't fill right now. Oh my gosh. So, so it worked. Because uh, somebody asked, you know, how, can, you know, how hard is it to go from like finance to academia? And the answer is just ask. You'd be surprised. Yeah, uh, yeah. A, lot of, a lot of universities actually value real world experience. When I was a consulting professor at Stanford, that what came about because I had real world experience and they wanted people to solve real problems, which are all always cross-disciplinary. That and, that and that's sort of the key and why someone like who's really a developer type. Um, we should, I, we should talk things. ourselves because I think we're I think we could definitely do some cool courses with your background around either Python. I mean, we have Python and machine learning thing, but I'm sure you could add a really cool element to that of some it's sort. like, yeah, how, how to do interesting and, and that was the first course I taught at Stanford, which is how to do interesting stuff with Python to solve really big problems. It was audited by four full professors at Stanford, which is like super daunting. <laughs> Um, it's like, you're like, okay, uh, I guess, I guess we're going to do this now. I yeah. better not screw it up. Um, but, um, yeah, because the answer, we live in a cross disciplinary world. You, you learn one pure thing. It doesn't teach you how to solve really big problems. Yeah. Working at the lab taught me to solve really big problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and it turns out those, those kinds of problems exist elsewhere, which is really what I sewed my whole career out of, mm -hmm. right? It's just find places with big problems and convince somebody that I can solve them. Um, I turned into a really great advocate for myself. Mm -hmm. was, was really in the second half of your career, the last seven. The other yeah. The first I 20, I just saved it up. And then yeah. the last 20, I just, I've just been letting it all go. Um, I went to Catholic school when I was a kid and the nuns would tell us, you know, do good work, sit quietly and God will reward you. 
And the answer is yes, but you have to ask people too. Uh, it turns out. <laughs> Um, there's a little caveat there. Little, little there's asterisk. a little caveat the nuns didn't add, add on. There was no little asterisk at the bottom. I'm saying this that. Um, and it took me a long time to figure that out. Yeah. That if you can't be, you, you have to be your best advocate. And a lot of my career is like, as I mentioned, yeah, hooking other people in to help advocate for you yep. really works. Um, and uh, you know, it got me there. And so I also had the best times when I picked jobs that were interesting and fun and the worst times when I picked jobs for money. Mm -hmm. I will, I will say, um, I ended up with a sort of this because people ask, how do you even know what to ask for? Yeah. I said, you know, I will do good work and I'll make your company productive. You know, the money will come. And I'm, I'm always convinced the money will come from being, from doing the work. Maybe, maybe the nuns got that part into the brain, right? But yeah. And, and, but it's true. You have to help and you do have to help it along. You have to show, where the money comes from and then the money will come to you yeah um, that's great so, you know, some some life lessons there some good great career lessons there i think uh that, that the listeners can take away i a lot of super interesting twists and turns to your career i think especially at the end i mean you're kind of hopping around there you know just i was looking for that last glorious ride into the sunset yeah and it didn't quite happen i just decided everything i wanted to do took time i didn't have and the one thing money cannot buy you is time. Yeah, but it, you know you did well enough over the years where. Yeah. You, oh yeah. Oh, it's easier to say that when you have money in the bank. I got. But you have. But you have two kids, and you're in, you were living in New York, so you weren't living in a super. And then Houston, obviously, for a little while. But you weren't. Yeah. You, you were living in a pretty high cost of living area. Did you feel like, um, were you living below your means for the for the most part? For the like, most part. Yeah. Um, it's Modest. funny because. Because my dad, uh, he was a PhD chemist. He founded a chemical comp company that eventually got bought out by somebody who was then bought out by Warren Buffett. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good, solid company. Yeah. He lived like a hick. Yeah. He did because money was not important to him. Yeah. Um, he, he felt that he could retire as soon as he had $1 million because he could live off $40,000 a year and do everything he wanted to do. Mm. And he lived out in the country and that made part of that easier. Um, yeah. And I think if we had not decided to retire in Southern California, we could have retired five years ago. Yep. Um, but my wife didn't want to live in South Carolina or Utah or even Texas. She liked being in Texas for a bit. Yeah. Um, but there's big bugs and mosquitoes and things, and she hates that. <laughs> That's what my wife said. I was like, hey, I'm really interested to go to Austin. Or She's like, no, I heard the bugs are so huge there. And it's- Yeah, we, we were in Houston where the mosquitoes are really big. <laughs> and, you know, there are gators in the, in the, in the, in the swamps. And, uh, you know, it's just, she said, this is fine for now, but we're not staying. And I said, okay. So you're, you're near Irvine, you said, right? Yeah, so I'm Riverside. So I'm loving it. It's in the Inland Empire. Um, it's a, yeah, my, my original Zoom background was my plane. That was sort of, I say I live modestly, except for my airplane. Except for your airplane. Okay, so how much um, was the I airplane? Did, so I have, uh, so I, I bought, I actually bought the airplane for about a quarter million dollars huh? and put about a hundred grand into it. That was all Zuckerberg money for my bonus go, signing on at Facebook. Yeah. And uh, now it's gone up in value because of the price in the airplane markets are just insane. I should have bought some as investments and just sold them. To, yeah. You know, <laughs> they they gone up by thirty percent. That's that's a pretty good return. Wow. Um, but uh, so I like I like to fly. I learned to fly late. I was in the Air Force. Tried to learn how to fly in the Air Force. Didn't finish because I had enough money to finish school or my pilot's license. Mm -hmm. And I chose probably school was a good choice there, and and yeah. it has worked out for me. Yeah. Um. So I kept my log books and learned when I was fifty, when my kids yeah. were uh, old enough not to want to talk to me anymore, and I refinanced the house and saved a little money. Because uh, yep. I just, you know, uh, did, did, didn't want to take it out of all because we were saving aggressively for for eventual retirement. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's like, it's it's fun. It's a great way to to turn gasoline into fun. Um, yeah. And so and, you're you're flying how often? Um, I've been flying. Well, that was one of the things. I was only flying like a couple times a month. Yeah. I don't want to fly more than that. Um, and so I've got, we've actually we're going to do a flying vacation. I'm going to fly to Wisconsin, and then we're going to go to visit friends in New York in the plane. Yeah. And then depending on whether we'll either go to like Kitty Hawk and see first flight airport, because that'll be fun. How does it work private, private travel? And since obviously you have the upfront capital of like, okay, you spent $350,000 in this place. So that's a lot of money to start. But then once you have it. Well, you don't have, oh, I have a very nice plane though. Yeah. You know, it's a, that's a, that's an expense. Like you can get cheaper planes in that. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. Th th this plane, um, 
New ones are about a million and a half. Um, they, they're styled after a Maserati. They have gull wing doors and leather interiors. Beautiful. Yeah. And it goes, it goes 200 miles an hour. It's just brilliant and fast. How many uh, people can it? Four. Four. Okay. And it's, got a, and it's got a parachute. So if you want to tuck your wife into a ride, let, let her know the whole <laughs> thing has a parachute. Uh, the views in Southern California are really cool. Um, you, and we can fly up to Big Bear, which is, you know, beautiful. Yep. So I like to fly around. I like I generally invite somebody along and go flying. I had somebody up. Uh, Fuel the most expensive part of it? Or is it like taxi? No, every, everything's expensive. Um, everything's expensive. Tell me, how does it really cost to fly from where you are up to your Wisconsin trip, for example? Uh, the Wisconsin trip, that's about uh, 10 hours of flying. So it's uh, 13 gallons an hour. So that's 130 gallons at uh, about five bucks a gallon. Five depends on where you are. So that's, the gas cart cost is not the worst of it. Yeah. It's insurance and a hangar to keep the plane in. Yeah. So and how parts much when it breaks and maintenance. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I go up and train with an instructor to make sure I'm safe and don't kill myself every once in a while. You think about a hundred thousand years in your plane about with the trips or? Uh, well, no. It's, it, I, I think well. If you if you just had a license, we're flying and renting planes, which yeah. is sort of another way to to think about it. Uh-huh. Um, I'm, I'm probably spending about thirty thousand a year on it. Okay. So you know, this is this is like an dependent. I'm just curious because I don't know. I didn't know. You know, I think it's interesting for people. Yeah. To, it, once yeah. you have a license, you can you can actually kind of fly if you're if you're joining a club or rent because it's actually a, a huge extravagance to have a plane for oneself. But I like it because it's in my hangar. I put my seatbelt on. It's in the right spot. No yeah. one's moved it. Uh, no one's dented my plane because no one else is, can fly it. Um, it. It is an extravagance. It is not practical in any way whatsoever. <laughs> and I don't care. Um, yeah. It is sort of my only outward thing that I'm rich. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Um, you know, the rest of it, I live in a, for Southern California, pretty nice, but not that crazy house. Yeah. There, there are nicer houses on my block and yeah. that's okay. I don't want that house. I, I like the house I'm in. Yep. Um, I'm going to community college right now with mm-hmm. a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds learning to be a mechanic because oh, I think cool. that'll be fun. That's awesome. And it's one of the things that I wanted to do, but took time. And that's, and that's why I retired. I wanted to fly. I wanted to you know, go take these mechanic classes. It's going to be fun. Uh, my son's engaged and soon I'll have a grandkid in Texas and I want to fly my plane to Texas and yeah. visit my grandkids. Um, all those things are time. Uh, I've been mentoring High school kids who want to fly, because why not? Why not? Uh, I've got maybe 20 people I'm mentoring that I've picked up over my career still. I mean, some go way, way back. That's great. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, Pat, you're going to be one of our, you're going to be in WSO mentors as well, right? So. I have signed up. I'm on the list. Check me okay. out. <laughs> I didn't even raise the prices. I, th- I want to provide <laughs> he kept it low. He kept it low for he all kept it low. You're getting an uh, incredible quant here. It's, it's a bargain. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I like the mentoring thing uh, because, again, I, I give people advice and, you know, it, the advice is what you make of it, but it's yeah. not people like to check that against real things. And I think that's a way to give back. Uh, I had great mentors early in my career really yeah. important to me that, that, that gave me the confidence to, you know, do some of the, these whack moves that worked out. Great. It, you, know, you, you, have, you have to know. Um, and particularly smart people think I can do everything myself. Mm-hmm. But there's things that you can't know up front. Exactly. And sometimes you just need to know the guy. I was trying to screw in a, a, a fitting. I couldn't get it to fit. I went to the hardware store. I, I said, I can't, I, I think I have the wrong fitting. It's not working. It says it's left turning, not right turning. <laughs> and you know, he solved my problem in three seconds. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he said, Don't worry, it happens all the time. And he was happy to tell us. And like the two other guys who had tried to help me said, I have no idea what's wrong. And we were all turn, 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 turn. And yeah. it was like, no, lefty tidy, righty loosey. And yeah. It was as simple as that. Sharing that knowledge, having someone to share that with helps you, accelerates what you can do. It makes you better than other people around you yeah. that are just trying to do it on their own. So you know, don't do it on your own. Get, get some help. Uh, it's totally worth it. Um, your, your mileage will vary. But um, you know, it's, it's been great. I, I'm glad I arrived here. I, was, I swore I was never going to uh, retire into a recession. Totally retire into a recession. Doesn't matter. Don't care. Um, <laughs> I said, I'm going to go on top of my game in a brilliant blaze of glory. And it's just sort of, I hit the end. I just said, I'm done. And I talked to the founder of the, of the blockchain startup and said, I'm just done. I just, I just don't have the energy and enthusiasm to do what needs to be done here. And he says, that's great. Um, part of great. I'm still on Slack. We still, we still talk. I mean, everything's great. I'm just not working there anymore. And the stress is off and I have time. Like today, I have an unstructured day. 
-hmm. but I've already talked with like five students from my classes because I'm oh. teaching lecture hall size. Three, I have 300 students. It's like, yeah. boom, yeah. you know, be a teacher. Um, but I'm energized and have energy I've not had for a long time. So telling me this is the right thing. To do. This is great. Uh, and it, you know, I had a number, but I threw that number out a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Once you have enough, it's enough. Well, I think people can do the math and figure out around how much you have. Uh, you, 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 you can make guesses. Um, I yeah. actually put up a rather accurate number on what on, on one of my blog com the comment on one of the blogs. Was, you you can you can guess, uh, and the IRS will not be surprised. They know about all of it, which is important. Though I try to work hard to minimize taxes, plan ahead. It's very also very important. Um, and you know, it just it just works out. And then you know, do things that are fun. You get one life. Do something fun with it. Don't grub for the last dollar. Yeah. Do something fun. Every job should teach you something for the next job so you can do something that's more fun. Fun leverages just like money does. And uh, but in the end, yeah, you know, it's when you know it's time, it's time. Time to stop. Do that. Great, Pat. Well, I appreciate all the time you spent with us today. Obviously, yeah, it went a little over the 45, but a little uh, over the 45 minutes, but it's great. Uh, I think uh, people will enjoy it. So appreciate your time. Yep. Yeah, I had a great time. Thank you very much, Patrick. And thanks to you, my listeners at Wall Street Oasis. If you have any suggestions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to send them my way, patrick at wallstreetoasis.com. Until next time.